Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Welcome to Stories Your Soul Food. I'm Andy Wilson. That's Brian Cole. Say hi, Brian. Hi. And we have with us the not esteemed one, but two not one, but two guests. guests the yeah. esteemed Walter Kern and Amanda Fortini. Is it Fortini? Fortini. That's yes. what I thought. Fortini. Awesome. Yeah, you never know on Twitter. It's like how is Could it Could be Fortini. Oh Fort- well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess Fortini. So. Amanda Fortini, and they have a deep dark secret, which is that they are married. Yep. So this is a writer couple that we have with us today. Thank you for coming. Yep. And their neighbors. Of sure. Idaho. Of yeah, Idaho. neighboring state, Montana. <laughs> oh, I, thought you were, I thought you were implying that we lived nearby <laughs> to each other. Which is sort of true because he <laughs> yeah. works downstairs and I work upstairs. So <laughs> we're our neighbors. Yeah. So there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of uh, a writer couple, but we're not going to talk about that stuff because we'll save that for some other podcast about, yeah. about writer couples. But we're going to talk to you, at least Brian, you, you can jump in anytime with your questions. But I wanted to ask you both, what was the first thing you remember reading if there was one that made you want to be a writer? I remember very distinctly things that I read as a child, although I'm not sure that they made me want to be a writer because I'm not sure I knew that I could be a writer, you know, somehow. <laughs> sure. I had never seen a writer. Well, I, the thing that gave you the bug. Yeah, right? the thing yeah. that gave me the bug. I mean, the things that I loved as a child is I love Charlotte's Web. Okay. You know, I loved this book called The Witch of Blackbird Pond. Yeah. I don't know if you ever encountered that. My dad, yeah. my dad yeah. assigns it. Oh, for, really? For fifth graders, yeah. He assigns it. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, it was like a Caldecott medal winner, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and that, I, yeah, that's amazing because I, I don't, I often mention it to people and people don't know it. There was another book I loved, which may be out of print called The Girl with the Silver Eyes. And it was about these children whose mothers had been given this thalidomide kind of like drug and the children had <laughs> tele, telekinetic powers and they found each other like around mm. the country and banded together. Huh. And then there was another one, um, and and I remember actually the heroine, the the main protagonist of that book. She loved. She was a, a smart, like literate little girl, and she loved the book, The Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh yeah, that was that was <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a fantastic book. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and then there was one called The Girl Who Owned the City, where all of actually it's very relevant right now. All of the adults were killed by a virus, and the children had to recreate like. Everybody over 12 was killed and the children had to create civilization from the ground up again. So I loved books about like smart, you know, intellectual, independent minded girls. We're kind of, we're learning a little something about what kind of a girl you were. Aren't yeah. We? Yeah. <laughs> very high achieving. Were very, you, yes, I was very high achieving. Were you actually. highly organized? Were you a highly organized child? No. You know, highly organized doesn't always go with high achieving. I would no, say a disorganized <laughs> high achieving child. Okay. Yeah. Who, our, who liked to stay up late reading in secret because my mom thought it was very eccentric that I would be up, you know, till two and three in the morning with a flashlight in my bed reading. When did you get your first writing job? Well, actually, I think I got it from my grandmother when I was supposed to take the um, birth story from the Bible and make it into a play for my for my cousins, <laughs> which was at nine years old. Commissioned. Yeah. Okay. Commissioned. That was my So first. you actually yeah. were commission, a commissioned writer prior to having <laughs> read some of these books. Yes, at nine, at nine, exactly. And they still have no, no wonder. Like no wonder you don't know which one made you want to be a writer. Well, I do know which one, but it wasn't until college. And that book was called The Silent Woman, which is Janet okay. Malcolm's book about Sylvia Plath and the project of biography. And it was, it's a book that is really very much like narrative nonfiction, literary nonfiction. And so I knew there was like, you know, novels and I knew there was newspaper writing, but this was the first thing. And I read it as a junior in college that was, you know, like, Combine both of them, you know, combined literary writing and combined journalism and factual reporting and made this very, you know, uh, it read like a novel, but it was nonfiction. Hmm. And I remember sitting in the library in college reading it and suddenly the light went on. It was like an epiphany, you know, this is what I want to do. Yeah, it was that book. And is that the kind of stuff that you enjoy writing the most? It's actually what I ended up doing was, yeah. you know, narrative nonfiction reported um reported stories that but is I, that still is is that the stuff that's like at your heart is that your beating heart 
I think that is my beating heart. I mean, I have a little bit of a hankering to dabble in fiction, but okay. for the most part, I really well, you do live love next door nonfiction. to Walter. Apparently, so you have to have you have to have <laughs> a little bit of a upstairs. Yeah. And he lives downstairs. <laughs> you have to have a hankering for fiction a little bit. I do. But he has, you know, I always say Walter has much more of an imagination than I do. Like if I wrote fiction, it would be kind of what they call auto fiction. You know, based on it'd be a Romana Clay or something. Yeah. <laughs> so Walter, do you have any memories of what what triggered the writing bug for you? I have absolutely vivid and depressing memories because- um, Fantastic. That'll, that'll inspire. Um, <laughs> I basically lived inside the Hardy Boys series as an alternative to life. You know, it was kind of pre-gaming. There was no parallel universe for children or, you know, yeah. Yeah. great young guys. Frank, Joe, and Chet. Do you yeah. have a favorite? Which one? <laughs> well, Frank and Joe actually were the two Hardy Boys, and Chet was the best friend. Right. He was chubby. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot about characterization from the Hardy Boys. I needed that you need to have only one characteristic. <laughs> Frank was serious. Joe was fun-loving. Chet was chubby. <laughs> uh, and he had to be because of the C-H in his name. <laughs> These were books that were written, I think, in like the 19-teens and 20s in a kind of factory setting <laughs> the, the, the franklin w dixon was not in, in indeed an author or even a person i don't think early packaging yes yeah. so then they had to update the books every 15 years to accommodate you know changing morals and <laughs> so on but certain aspects of the early books had had stayed uncensored and unfiltered into the early 1970s or late 1960s and early 70s when I was reading them. And one was the word swarthy. All, <laughs> oh, yes. All the villains in the Hardy Boys series were swarthy. I still uh, love that word. Right. And every third chapter ended with Frank slumped unconscious to the floor. <laughs> on that, and, and it was the first vision I had of the perfect sentence. Because no matter how many times you encountered it, in different stories, it always grabbed me. <laughs> um, and so I had these very almost primitive notions of storytelling as a result of reading these things over and over compulsively. And I never imagined that I might write them because they seemed like they had come sort of like the Bible from- they just arrived. You know, they just arrived, <laughs> yeah. um, you know. Who, almost dug out of the ground. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Somebody I was, came down from the mountain. Yeah. And I wasn't sure that like, the Hardy Boys didn't exist somewhere. I had a very hazy notion of what separated fact and fiction. And my father used to lecture me about it because I was a storyteller as a kid, um, meaning a liar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> By which we mean. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I basically, I think that the reason that man writes fiction is to get out of trouble. Um, <laughs> and, and so. That well, you get into it by writing fiction. Well, then you find out that that's what happens as a result of trying to get out of it. You get in more of it. But telling stories about where I was since there was a 20 minute walk between school and home for three hours, um, <laughs> that was my original writing job, you know, <laughs> and storytelling job. It yeah. is true that your dad was very concerned <laughs> about it. And my father sat me down one time and he said, Walter, we're going to have to talk about the difference between fact and fiction. <laughs> and he, he actually said that to me as about an eight-year-old. And it was terrible <laughs> criticism because he was an attorney and he was, he was all about the facts and he was all about what could be proved and established. And I was all about what could be gotten away with. <laughs> and then, so, to have us in the same... So, 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 it was the Hardy Boys. I wasn't sure they didn't exist. I thought maybe this way, these were the true accounts of actual... <laughs> Because they purported to be cases of, right. of the father, Fenton Hardy. And the wonderful thing about the Hardy Boys was they were a perfectly sonnet-like, elegant storytelling form in which the father began with a case at the beginning, which he discussed over the kitchen table. You know, dad, you know, are you still looking for the missing, you know, uh, airplane? <laughs> yeah. Then the kids would go out on a date with their friends. And come across a swarthy man <laughs> with a piece of an airplane. With a piece of an airplane. <laughs> and the end of the hard, every Hardy Boys story was Frank and Joe rescuing their father from <laughs> uh, sort of a mutual rescue. It was a wonderful reunion. 
anybody who's religious would understand it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a crisis, and then father and son are reunited. <laughs> and I so wanted this in my own family that I couldn't stop reading them. But then the first grown-up <laughs> book that came into my life, the thing that shattered the Hardy Boys reality was Dracula. Mm. My mom was a member of some fakey, you know, world's classics, world's most <laughs> beloved classics book club that gave you vinyl covered copies of, of Homer and so on with fake vinyl. Yeah. These must be very expensive if you found a copy now. Right. <laughs> All vinyl was called a certain kind of leather in those days. <laughs> you know, like, like, you fact know, and uh, fiction again. Serbian leather. <laughs> yeah, back to fact, <laughs> and, and and vinyl. Serve, back to fact and fiction. Yeah. And, and I delved into Dracula expecting, I had probably seen Dracula type movies or vampire movies. Yeah, knew of it. Knew of it, expecting some ripping Hardy Boys times 10 story. And it's, a, it's an epistolatory novel. Yeah. Or, or it's so-and-so's journals, the letters yeah. of so-and-so. It's like uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I read next, which is also a completely oblique yeah. story told through documents where you have to put together what actually happened, <laughs> you know, backwards. And you sideways. have to be the hardy boy. Yes. And I went, this is amazing. It was such a jump in, in sophistication and complexity, and it never gave you the rewards. There was no Frank slumped unconscious to the floor. You, no you, reunion with the father. No reunion with the father. <laughs> it was just like well, I'd gone from Goodnight Moon to James Joyce. And putting those two ends together became my project, you know. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so that's where would you put your own resolution to be a writer? I like get around what age? Oh, 13. Eight, making up stories. And, for there, dad, and there was but, a very simple reason why I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be on the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> they still they still had writers on national talk shows on TV at late hours in that time. And so you would have somebody like Truman Capote next to Raquel Welsh. Yeah. Being interviewed by Johnny Carson against a backdrop of Times they haven't changed. Yes. And and I went, that's what I want to do. I want to sit next to Raquel, Raquel Welsh, Welsh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and discuss my new quote novel, whatever that is. <laughs> and I'll do anything to get there. <laughs> Yeah. That's true. That's I, I like that that's as an great. origin story. Yeah, that's very fun. You've touched on it a couple of times, but Blood Will Out is, uh, I've obviously read some of your guys' essays and then Blood Will Out. The distinction between fact and fiction, what is it? What makes a story true is a question we wanted to yeah, ask. Especially what guys. makes a, a fictional story true. It's something Le C.S. Lewis talked about, Tolkien talked about trying to write true fiction. Well, Blood Will Out was a story of my relationship with a con artist who pretended to be a Rockefeller, turned out to be a murderer, and who was a friend of mine for 10 years, and I was unsuspecting the whole time. So, here's a story that I could have told as a novel, I could have written, Yeah. but why? It was too outlandish, it was unbelievable. How could a journalist be fooled by a German exchange student who had watched the show Gilligan's Island and was impersonating a Rockefeller based on you know, <laughs> that, uh, de that degree of research. <laughs> that degree of research. So that would not have seemed true if fictionalized. Right. You know, Mark Twain famously said, you know, fiction has a burden that nonfiction doesn't. It must seem lifelike. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wise. And, yeah. And, and so as far as true fiction goes, it must be true to something. In other words, no two fictional stories are true in the same way. Some are true because they reflect human behavior in an irresistibly accurate way. Some are true because they conjure up a place in a way that we recognize deeply. You know, Oliver Twist is true because it's true to London street life of a certain kind. You know, um, Catcher in the Rye is true because it refers to a kind of moment when teenagers feel they know everything and are <laughs> cynical and can dismiss the rest of the world as phony. Do you think so? If you jump back to Amanda, one of the books you mentioned was Charlotte's Web. Mm -hmm. Would you say, or could you say, do you think of a book like that, that it's a true, it's, this is a true book? Not necessarily, we're not saying it's not fiction, it's fiction, 
But is that a true story? Is it touching on something true? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously it's fiction since the spider yeah. is the right spider is writing. Obviously, but things yes. have been crazy. So far. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Um, I think we're all not trusting Books where our animals talk are harder to make true is. <laughs> um, but I do think there's, yes, there's the 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 spirit of it or the essence of yeah. it is true, which is this, and the thing that I loved about it is like, there's this very sort of, you know, elegant, you know, uh, female writer at the core. And so I feel like that in itself was something like, oh, I could recognize this as true, you know, that there's this kind of person that is. Um, or spider, you know, that is yeah. a, an elegant writer and cares about language and understands the power of language to change things and is a wonderful editor. And, you know, what is it? The last line, it's not often that someone is a great friend and a great writer. Charlotte yeah. is both. But also the friendship at the, the heart of the book feels right. so true. And, you know, I think children recognize the truth of a story maybe more than a, adults do. And I remember my mom read that to me when I was three, which was a little bit too soon. <laughs> And my and mom, you remember that I remember because I remember my mom crying so much wow. at the end, just yeah. bawling. And I was like, mom, it's okay. And I didn't really understand why she was crying. But then I read it again at, you know, eight or nine and yeah. I cried and, you know, I, or I felt sad, you know, and then just successively through my life, it's like, I would reread it. And it's a book whose core message or core, you know, kind of relationships and remain true. You know, yeah. like you said, it is fiction, obviously, but it's, it has the truth of real, real life, you yes. know? So one, yeah. one of the things that we've talked about in the past is when you're writing for kids, especially the ability to sub in talking animals or something like that enables you to address a, a heavy theme right. or something that's got some like freight or weight to it that would be too crushing. Like death of yeah, the spider. Loss, yeah. Yeah. And so on. I was just going to say something, Nate, that I, I thought was out of left field and you came straight to it, which was as a child, I usually considered true in a book that it was depressing in some way. <laughs> hmm. Now, I, I, I'm that saying- That is depressing. That's I, a depressing I, no, yeah, but, but in life and in storytelling and in my family and in my community, everybody constantly wanted you to feel good and positive yeah, and so code. on. And you would sometimes read a book, and I, I'm thinking of Stuart Little, the sort of counterpart, right? right. which was depressing. I don't remember. I think he like goes off at the end. In search for uh, what's the canary? He goes off to find the bird, right? Yeah. Sort of like the end of my novel, Up in the Air, where the guy just flies off just into flies nowhere. Away. Yeah. And I'm thinking, this is the most melancholy, <laughs> depressing notion that this mouse who's been at the center of this action in you know it's New York City and so is going to go off, I don't know where into the fog and i felt a stab of pain in about life that was kid-sized the yeah, kid-sized ecclesiastes yes exactly yeah. it was kid-sized all his vanity and I, and and we will all search for the canary and disappear <laughs> i mean i think the last illustration was stuart little as a, almost a little dot or yep. something vanishing yes and so truth to me as a kid was bound up with a notion of hard more melancholy yeah. messages. A glimpse of heaviness or love. Yes. Yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about in the past on this podcast, and one of the reasons why we started it is to talk about stories as soul food for kids, like the kind of, the kind of books that strengthen you. It's like, we're not looking for, we're not talking about Sunday school lessons or things like that, but the kind of things that actually fill you out, give you stronger muscles, uh, especially in terms of your imagination like strengthening your imagination and equipping you as a better character as you grow into your own story. The yeah. Hardy Boys were not that, by the way. Yeah. The Hardy Boys <laughs> they were They set just, you up really well for Dracula. <laughs> they were an early exercise in addiction. Sure. Really. Okay. The, you know, in the addictive qualities of storytelling, where you just want the same thing yeah. over and over. Or the constellation of storytelling, where you know what to expect, you know, because it follows certain narrative lines. Yeah. That's there why I love go. Nancy say, Drew. Say, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. you're a, I was going to ask if yeah. you were a Nancy Drew fan. I was a Nancy Drew and Encyclopedia Brown. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I loved them too. Yes. And that was a smart act. Alec in me. I love the idea of solving mysteries before others had. Um, you know, Walter always goes to his own vices, his own right. vices. <laughs> He's had to analyze it. So Without them, I have nothing. <laughs> so if, if we're talking about kids now in this moment, kids with canceled school, kids who have nowhere to go and nothing to do, books are there, stories are there. And there's a 
it's a very dangerous moment for a lot of kids, like an extremely dangerous moment, either in terms of loss of education or just depression or, I mean, really escapism in an unhealthy way. Or yeah, you know, like there's, there's a lot of ways you can go. If you're in sixth grade, you're in seventh grade and everything's canceled. This would be a moment I think a lot of kids are going to be diving into books in different ways, video games, other things as well, other, other forms of escapism. What would you like? What, what would be your top three books that you think kids should be reading? And I'm thinking like, like early teens and on down. So like 10 to 14, what would be the books that should be read now when you're coming of age in the apocalypse, at least in this, the faux apocalypse or whatever it might be? I do think Charlotte's Web, if you're young, because it does yeah. show the power of, you know, like I said, language and yeah. writing, you know, to change things, um, to change writing reality. To save a life, yeah. yeah. I do think this book, The Girl Who Owned the City, would be very. I'm going to go um, get that one myself. They're going to make a Hollywood movie out of it. And it, it, it's there, if you look online there, like I said, there's some people who, you know, criticize the book because they think it's sort of Ayn Randian, which is because it's about the power of the individual to sort of overcome. But I feel Atlas like, shrugged. Yeah, all <laughs> it's like a child-sized Atlas shrugged. The parents shrugged, quit. I guess. <laughs> um, no, the parents are all gone and this one little girl, you know, she finds the strength within her to rebuild civilization. And there's like a dissenting faction where they fight and, you know, she's true to her own ethos and, you know, she doesn't tolerate dissent story, from her camp. A story for you when all the adults have let you down. Yes. And that's what, <laughs> like it, that's what, that's what it is. And, and, and that society will go on because, you know, young people have the strength to rebuild. I, I feel like kids would take a lot from that. I have to think of what my third prescription would be. What about you, Walter? Well, you see, we're talking about seventh graders, right? Yeah, and younger. I mean, we're talking about yeah, younger, fifth older. Fifth graders, sixth graders, and seventh graders. And when I grew up, there was a very specific reading list for kids of this age. It involved short stories with twist endings. Oh, Henry. Oh, Henry stories. I hated oh, right. him. Like, I yeah. hated him. The most yeah. dangerous game. Yeah. 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 I love that one. Yeah, yeah. I've that never one. slept in a better bed, <laughs> rains for thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. love that the story. The most dangerous game was about hunting humans. Well, what's the, one <laughs> of the, the short story about the guy dying in the grain elevator? Those are all ones we had. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. The lady and the tiger. Ray Bradbury, yeah. something yeah. wicked with this way comes. Right. Um, <laughs> all of these stories were anthologized. And given to sixth graders in Minnesota. It was fifth grade, and yeah, in my case, Miss Strum read them to us. Where, where and so what and was so the anthology. I, I can't remember. Oh, okay. All I remember was that there were three kinds of of stories in the Cold War era when I was educated. Everything was systematized, and they had classified fiction as having three conflicts. And I remember what they were: man versus man. Okay. Which was yeah. Yeah. people right. fighting, read, yeah. Yeah. man versus nature, mm. which Jack was like London. Moby Dick, <laughs> right, Jack somebody London. in a storm, and yeah. then there was the brain twisting, highly intelligent, ironic man versus himself. <laughs> and I and I remember thinking, man versus himself is where the action is. <laughs> I want. I think read, it was all set up. I, I think it was all set up. Man him. versus man, <laughs> like I want to read about sword fights and. and <laughs> But I know that the intellectuals do this man versus himself. I know thing. you don't get on Johnny Carson unless <laughs> yeah, you're running yeah, man exactly, versus himself. Yeah, exactly. That was the most sophisticated one where you're, <laughs> you're a little sixth grade and your brain was on fire. Yeah, it, basically yeah. meant, it basically meant schizophrenia to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I, I love that because that's also, I remember getting that same little, you know, trident presented to me. <laughs> right. And yeah. uh, it was so clearly set up. To respect man versus himself as the most sophisticated. Right. right. Yes. Like, so you can write a story about a boy and his dogs, right. or you can write a story about two people fighting, or. You well, so, can... so my first short story was about a young man who had somehow bred a super dog. It had glowing fangs, it had powers, <laughs> and, and he, he, it was a, a ruthless and pitiless uh, super dog. He had enemies outside his house. So he, he bred the dog to this pitch of ferocity and then let it outside to kill all his enemies and locked all the doors. <laughs> but it came down the chimney and killed him. I was, I was gonna say, in your, in your taxonomy, you twist. <laughs> yes. So it was kind of man versus himself, meaning man versus his evil dog that he created. But I was so satisfied with it and it had such an effect on my seventh grade teacher. And 
<laughs> what I feel sorry for kids right now is in, they don't have the ability to impress anyone with their skills. You know, it's yeah. like, how yeah. do I get the class prize? How do I get my teacher to go, Walter, you've taken man versus himself <laughs> to, to a, a new level. A new level you know? Did you have the Young Authors Prize? That's oh, what we yeah, did. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we, a, we, I'm sure all of us won that. The award was a date with oh, we had it. Welsh. I wrote, I see my first short story was around the same age. And I, all I remember about it, I re, well, I remember two big things. Most of it happened in a cave <laughs> after a Scottish battle. I wanted the conflict and the big man versus man thing, but I, just describing action was not, <laughs> like, didn't feel like the story. So, somebody trying to recover after this Scottish battle, and I was trying to find a way to describe firelight. Oh. And I happened upon dancing. And I remember being so, so thrilled <laughs> that I had found the perfect image, the a perfect metaphorical metaphor verb. that yeah. no one else had ever found. It's pretty sophisticated <laughs> for a seventh yes. grader. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. never before. And then I gave it to my grandfather to read and he told me it was terrible. And that was like that whole experience of, of my grandfather being like, this is really not good. Just so you know. And, and told me to go read Kipling. He was a big Kipling fan. And I didn't. That was right. my, my response at the, at the moment. How, how old were you? Seventh grade? Uh, seventh or eighth grade. Yeah, I think that's when the, that's really when I knew it intuitively, like you were asking me before, when I wanted to be a writer. I think yeah. sixth and seventh grade is when your brain starts to figure out metaphorical right. and figurative, you know, figurative language. Right. But also yeah. you get a teacher who praises you. You have somebody right. who says, hey, that was good, man. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, we haven't done a quite the service you asked, which was tell the world what, <laughs> what the prescription is. <laughs> And we'll I'm gonna, there. I'm going to say there are anthologies of short stories that I think give kids the range, and I think that that yeah, a sample of it, a lot of different. That's flavors. a wonderful way to start. Do you, you think know? kids should be reading 1984? Yes, yes. 451. Yes, and Catcher in the Rye too. Actually, yeah. that sort of insurrectionary, you know, youthful intelligence that he has, and that in yeah, yeah, I, exactly. 1984 and Animal Farm though. Animal we, Farm. We like read kids, those in seventh yeah. grade. My kids um, are big Animal Farm fans. Ray Bradbury, maybe. I remember my brain being lit on fire by Dandelion Wine. Have you ever read right. that? Oh, yeah. 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 No, yeah. that's a similar experience. I remember all about lawnmowers from that, like a description of the sound of lawn, lawns being mowed. And it's, it's stuck with me in terms of like, make sure you describe something totally peripheral to the scene. Right. To make the scene real was like, that was the lesson I took then. It's like, I had a lot of lawnmowers, a lot of distant lawnmowers in my writing. Right, since the, then. <laughs> the sensory details. And yeah. I remember learning, like having a similar thing where you, you said you, you, you used the verb dancing for firelight that I wanted to describe. I wrote a short story after reading Dandelion Wine and I wanted to describe the characters as insignificant. So I called them like pennies in a wallet full of $20 bills. <laughs> and nice. I thought that was so nice. sophisticated no, that's, 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 in, in sixth or seventh that's grade. That's a women's you know? wallet. Men's wallets don't include the coin. Say, it's true. Uh, you don't my, have the my coin first, My first thought is like, that's, I like that because they're not even supposed to be there. Right, exactly. <laughs> in, in it doesn't quite wallet. work. <laughs> yeah. But well, that's much better than dancing. If I do, I remember the almost euphoria, the eureka moment that came with happening on dancing firelight but that was this groundbreaking description i feel like it's impressive kind of, well you know? you know i think we can be honest and say it's not <laughs> <laughs> but, well, verb, you know using verbs in a metaphorical way i feel like is the is is a more sophisticated way of writing than yeah. just having a simile or something so sure. it's pretty sophisticated for a seventh I'll, grader i'll take the gold star i'll take the gold himself. star but I, man man versus versus himself. Himself. <laughs> I, was I was definitely working versus myself I, I threw that away and the thing that's funny is after that i basically i wrote a very occasional short pieces of fiction, but almost exclusively creative nonfiction sketches after that. That's interesting. And just kind of veered away from trying to worry about arc and narrative and just trying to capture moments and scenes and characters. And if I could just like be a photographer with words. And then later on, it wasn't really till, you know, late high school, college, I returned to trying to put that into fiction. I just remember rewriting lots of myths. So, you know, you recontextualize the myth yeah. or retell Tuck Everlasting and you're in- And that's kind of your dad's that, thing. So, that's, Brian's, that's my dad Brian's does, backstory yeah. here, Brian's dad was my fifth grade teacher, is currently <laughs> teaching my fifth child fifth grade, has taught all of my children fifth grade after me. So, we have this generational lap through his, his dad as fifth grade teacher. And Brian was born 
when I was in that fifth grade class. <laughs> so I was a fifth grader in his dad's class when he told us that he had and just you had guys us. like <laughs> move a pencil with your mind. This is small town America here. I know. Uh, so when it. he talks about retelling myths, all I remember is his dad making me retell yeah, myths. Exactly. Over so and that over. doesn't surprise me that that was the, the thing in the coal household. That's what I did. Yeah. Retell the cobblers with rats as the main characters instead. You know, the little, I don't know. I don't know how that helped me. None of it's lasted. But, well, uh, it is kind of a good thing to have kids do because I, I do think we see like those, you know, kind of classical archetypal stories, you know, like the hero's yeah. journey or whatever, yeah. and it recurs over and over again in different stories. So, or the, you know, so many rom-coms, for instance, are just a retelling of Cinderella or whatever. Yep. So, he's kind of getting your little minds my used to grade, doing that. My fifth grade daughter in his dad's class just came home and told me, it's like, so dad, I, want, I need you to read my story. I was like, oh, what is it? It's a retelling of Oedipus. No. There you go. <laughs> I was like, what? I, was I like, still oh, don't understand he's keeping, it. Yeah, he's keeping it edgy. Like, Mr. Mr. It Cole is 2020. It's 2021. It edgy. <laughs> to me, Oedipus is just my dog story. Like, he let it out, <laughs> but it came down to Jimmy and his leg. And it came back and bit him. Yeah, it came back and bit him. You know, but I was thinking, she, she might, and Amanda knew my mother a little. My mother died younger than she should have. But she was a self-consciously literary person. As a nursing student at Ohio State, I think she had, in the early 60s, wanted to become a kind of bohemian literary figure, not have this practical career. But she never had one. And, and so I'm, I think, the son of a frustrated writer, maybe, hmm. or a, a writer who didn't become one. And so my mom would actually push on me once she saw, you know, that I would read stories that she thought would improve me. And I remember the first, and this is like therapy because I didn't remember it coming into this. And it has to do with my notion that important stories should be depressing. <laughs> it was To Build a Fire by Jack oh, Lennon. Right, right. Yeah. I, was trying, I, I was like, this is the most deviously <laughs> um, self-abolishment ever. A guy does everything he can to you know, overcome cold only to kill himself, right? Isn't that it? Yeah. Like yeah. he melts the snow and Off it comes down and puts the fire out. Yep. And then he dies. Yeah. So what's the moral of that story? It's man versus nature and man versus You're himself. going to lose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the moral, the moral of, story. of that story is you can't win for losing. Right. <laughs> like, yes. just say, Give oh, up oh, now. Oh, or, or should he have not tried? Oh. Like I kept thinking about, is this story heroic because he tried and he failed or is it a warning against trying you know yeah and then i recently learned that jack london only lived in the arctic for a year or something like that and then went back to california and not only that <laughs> he paid other people to come up with his plot no okay. jack london was one of the first you know celebrity writers everybody wanted to hear his tales of adventure and sinclair lewis i think the first american to win the nobel prize was one of the people who supplied plots to him he was like a writer on a... Oh, no. Uh, and then he kept... Was it Babbitt for himself? So yeah. That Sinclair Lewis. yeah. It's like, why didn't he give Babbitt to Jack London and write one of <laughs> Because all of Sinclair Lewis's books, if you really want to get into him, because I'm a fan of his, don't have stories. No, They're they just not. character, yeah. uh, big character expositions. And that, I think I read that one in the fifth grade, actually. Okay. I read Babbitt? Babbitt. Babbitt. And I raged against it. Yes. I hated it. It was like, bring me King Solomon's Mines and Lord right. of the Rings and, and Robert adventure, Louis adventure. Stevenson. Yeah, absolutely. More, more pirates, please, was sort of my, my approach at the time. Pirates and orcs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I still love that. And I'm drawn, I'm drawn to telling those kinds of Errol Flynn, you know, stories, right. uh, especially, for, especially for kids. But uh, in, this, in this particular moment, what, what would be like the, the most important thing you say to any, any kid, as long as we're here? And a lot of people are listening. It's like living in this moment and this scene and this like, it feels like we're in act two of something. We're approaching that dark night of the soul if we're not already there. We might not be at the bottom culturally. That's but, it, yeah. um, you know, it's one of those things that like depressing stories. Is, is this a true story because it's depressing? What, What's I, the, what I want to say to kids is you don't have to get used to this. That's good. You don't have to get used to this. Or just don't get used to this. Yeah, don't get Refuse used to it. Refuse to get used to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if you're upset, be no. upset. If you're angry about it, be angry. It, it, it's not your fault. This is not your fault. This is the most 
if you're going to use the language of therapy, dysfunctional family event in the history of our country. It has no purpose. We're not fighting a war against real enemies. It's man against himself. It's man against himself big time. And it's not your fight. Your job is to survive, have fun, read, learn, do everything you can. If the school system isn't letting you do it through them, you find a way, but it's not your fault. And you don't have to get used Just to know it. the dog is coming down the chimney. <laughs> no. The dog no. is yeah. coming. That's for the people who created this mess. <laughs> yes. The dog yes. will come for them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I think also that it's so hard to instill this in children because or young people because they just don't have, you know, the experience that bears it out, the life experience, yeah. but that it's just one moment in time. And that if you Right. You know, it's just a snapshot and like, like, time, like the arc of time is long and, you know, yep. it will, it will this change. One of the reasons why reading history is important. Yeah. Nothing lasts forever kind yep. of thing. Everything, it's- everything changes, you know. Um, yeah. And, and also that the, I, I think the rebellious spirit often triumphs, you know, and I think that is what I, I saw in the literature I liked as a, yeah. as a child. Um, I once had a therapist tell me to tell that to me, rebels tend to fare better up to a point, you know, where, where like yeah. if they're in a sort of strict or um unlivable or untenable situation like the rebels find a way to get themselves out of it so like you don't sort of have to do everything that you're told there's been a a, one of the reasons why it feels like we're in a giant story that we're we're in a weird narrative moment is because of all the reversals that are going on like that rebellious spirit that has triumphed that uh rebellion that the generation of the 60s pushed and pushed and pushed it's and like catechized. unfashionable now yeah it's yeah. like they just they pushed it and then now it's conform, conform, flipped conform, so now conform. you know guys who are music video directors for punk rock bands are getting fired because they won't wear a mask or it's like the punk the punk scene is no longer they're no longer the punks it's just kind of odd it's like to be uh a conservative right now of any of any stripe of any degree and in any way is extremely punk rock where the reversals are in Footloose, like the Kevin Bacon character is is now the religious right, weirdly. Uh, if only they would figure that out and start to act like the Kevin Bacon character. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, yeah. Actually, and actually just dance. <laughs> <laughs> because Amanda and I are married, I can inject stories about her and facts about her that she doesn't realize her Jermaine and she's from Wheaton, Illinois. So I believe she used go. to tell me I'm community. from the town but that Footloose even... was based on. No, well, I, w- I don't think it was based on, but I said it was sort of like growing up in Footloose because um, I was, I was, you know, not raised evangelical and yeah. it was a very. You are raised Catholic. You used I was to raised Catholic. with evangelicals yeah, yeah, my, and get in trouble for it. All my friends were evangelical, but um, it was a very strict kind of repressive, you know, yeah. environment in many ways. And I, w- I always just say like, it was like kind of growing Growing up in Footloose, yeah. And now, but see, now we're all in Footloose. We're in one giant. Oh, this is Walter's specialty. We're in one <laughs> big giant Footloose, and this oh, is not to say that your you know sixth graders need to go watch Footloose, but this is this is what we're in. It's just a, a, an amazing reversal. It's a huge reversal where the the lines have all been like moved. The deck has been shuffled, and there are uptight people <laughs> who are they were they were the ones who held the mascot of rebels for so long. I, and now they're the I can just see new new stories with this premise, like. Mom, I'm leaving. I, I want to read the Bible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I'm getting out with I'm my girl. Punk rock. We're hitting it. We got the car. We bought a car. I've been working nights without you knowing it. We're going to go read the Bible in Kansas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See ya. See ya. And you can't stop us. Make all the rules you want. You have the very tattooed parents with the kids yeah, who yeah. are refusing to get pierced. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of where we're heading. The last thing I wanted to comment on just to like circle back and then we can we can wrap this thing up is that you mentioned was it twain talked about fiction has to feel true yeah yeah so in your own life you've had a lot of like odd odd mystical experiences happen that at least i see on twitter yes um the one that springs to mind right now is after your father's passing a bear climbing through a kitchen window in in your house and it's the kind of thing where do you think of this reality as more magical realism slash fantasy which is kind of how i slot the actual world the world in which we live is sometimes dystopian sometimes not but always magical realism slash fantasy uh we're going mach 86 on a ball of lava around a burning ball of fire in the sky you know it's like we're we're in a weird world and then we have weird behaviors and then these mystical things happen uh are they that mystical though or are we 
Are they actually normal? The or world is that they, way. Or, or have we been trained to ignore them? Right. You know, um, so do you do, will you infuse, how heavily will you infuse that stuff into your fiction where you manufacture it, you create it versus keeping yourself writing essays and nonfiction when you deal with those things? So Amanda was present at the death of my mother, after which I began to see ravens and crows yeah. in, 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 in abnormal. I've assigned that piece you published on Amazon. I've assigned, assigned that to the students. The stones, the crows. Yeah. 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 A, in abnormally intimate situations. She was part of it. I can only speak from my experience of it, but she experienced it with me. Not yeah, because so it's of either me. real or a folly at death. Independent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yesterday, yesterday morning, Amanda comes to me and says, I'm trying to make a decision in my career and I'm wondering about Do it. Do I go on this podcast? And I pick up, <laughs> no. no, and she picks up a piece of clothing, right? Yes. And it, it, it said it was Raven brand clothing. Yeah. And, and that meant yes. <laughs> and, 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 We've gotten used to looking for these signs. <laughs> what, what she doesn't like know it. is that right after she told me that, I walked out the door, getting ready, packing my truck for this trip and a raven, huge raven was up on the corner of the building. You know how sometimes they just have to get your attention? Oh, yeah. Rah, rah, look at me. Yeah. But, you know. They want eye contact. Yes. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and then we took a trip across the mountains. It's a pretty raven heavy, between Montana and here is a pretty raven heavy yeah. environment. I saw every one of them. Now, <laughs> is that magical realism or cause, because the, none of them it's just were the cartoons, yeah. None, yeah. none of them were visions, they were all real. I think that good storytelling lets you see the symbolic patterns that are in the world, yeah. that, that are real, and which you are especially privy to or attentive to, I think in times of difficulty, you know, for whatever reason, yep. either because they're given to you, you know, as consolation or, 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 yeah. or because the mind, you know, you can give psychological or, or religious or other philosophical explanations all for the same thing. But I think one of the great things about reading and one of the great things about stories is is you begin to understand the story of your own life. Yeah. It begins to seem like a story yeah. that has themes, that has a goal. Motifs and tropes and all sorts of things yes. show up. Yeah. And that's, and that's a kind of beautiful place to exist in where your own yeah. life is looking like a narrative to you because it allows you to weather all kinds yep. of things. That, that's probably the ultimate yeah. advice for kids. You, know, you can make page. a story of this. Yeah. Yeah. There's another page, there's another chapter, and there's some artistry and intentionality to it. Yep. So I've made a lot of my characters suffer. I know you have. <laughs> you, Amanda, writes about characters who are already suffering. Yes, yeah. people, who, who, people who've uh, endured shootings and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, and celebrities, celebrity and celebrities. <laughs> yes, and celebrities. There's a lot of those. But yeah, this is uh, it is it is really interesting. The world is magical by a realist's standards. Like yes. somebody who did, right. one of the one of the ironies we've pointed out and talked about is the fact that realism is defined as the thing that you know the the genre that is the least like the real world it's like when we call right, that, right. we call that realism right uh, this world where there are these recurring themes and you know ecclesiastes is true and there are ravens and cardinals and all sorts of animals that show up after losses and weird things happen and previous civilizations have looked for them maybe a little too much but we've just numbed ourselves to them in an right. amazing way they they may have they you know, here, this will blow your mind. So the raven thing happened because I was reading the Bible and, and started noticing raven uh, references. I was writing, a, having found a Bible of my mother's and kept noticing raven references. With her annotations yeah. in it, you know, he read, it, he read the Bible through looking at his mother's annotations on the Bible. And the most poignant reference was to the raven that flew away from Noah, Noah's Ark. Right. The dove came back. But the raven never did. Yeah. yeah. And that was like my mother, you know, that was like death. Yeah. You go off somewhere and who knows where it is. And I, I came in having read that passage to see Amanda and talk to her about it. And I was on a porch with a sliding glass door by the Pacific Ocean. And while I was telling her about it, I looked back and there was a raven standing on the Bible. On the Bible. And I saw it too. Wow. Yeah, just standing on the Bible. But what's then a song? Uh, then a song. And Walter has a witness. Then yeah. a song came on the radio that we had never heard before. That was one of the catchiest songs we'd ever heard. We're sitting there, almost in a state of 
you know, symbolic, <laughs> like euphoric, symbolic euphoric, symbolic and, overload. Yeah. Symbolic yeah. Symbolic yeah. overload. <laughs> and song comes on, rock me mama like a wagon wheel. Yeah. Rock me. Yeah, by the old crow uh, medicine by show. The yeah. Old crow medicine show. So, and, <laughs> and, then, and then it was too much. So we and got in is, the car to escape yeah. our apartment. No, I'm not kidding. And there was there was a song on the radio that I had never heard by the Grateful Dead called The Wheel, which is all about the turning wheel of life. And, and this, you should have learned just turn the radio off. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> it was, it was, listening, it was, shut your it, eyes. Too many, like, too many messages. Escape from meaning, you know. And this is the funny thing is as a writer, you could tried to pull that off in a scene but that but, but the overload it factor be, of like, you wouldn't believe people it. would be like no well so that's what no. i was gonna that's it's what i was gonna say that's, it's interesting is that when walter writes about the mystical experiences though he writes about them in non-fiction that's what I, yeah. yeah that's what you're saying because he they wouldn't be believable in fiction yeah. unless then we put them in the genre of magical but, realism yeah, but here's yeah. the coup de grace here's the here's the tie-up that i'm leading to <laughs> manda did not answer accurately about the first literary work which inspired her. I didn't. I know this true story. At 18 <laughs> months old, oh, right. Amanda was able, I found out in the midst oh, right. of I forgot about this one. the episode I'm just telling you, was able to recite the Raven. My grandfather taught me no the way. Raven. Yes. Wow. So my, my, my grandfather. She's 18 month old. Well, so I started talking really. My, my mother was a big reader. She read to me, you know, when I was in the womb. She read the Russian novels to me when I was a baby in the womb. When I got out of the womb, she was a school teacher. She had flashcards on everything. Like this would have a sign that said Diet Coke and microphone and table. And she just worked with me. She did all of these physical exercises where they were supposed to help the brain develop. So I started speaking, according to her, because of her, you know, exercises at 18 months old, or I mean, sorry, at nine months old. And then my at 18 months when I'd been talking, supposedly, according to family lore, like an adult for a year, almost a year, my grandfather <laughs> taught me the raven. And it was his party, it was his party trick, you know, where he right. would pull out this tiny little kid and be like, Amanda. Uh, shouldn't be able to yeah, and so make then, his intelligible would, sound. And then I would start in my cartoon voice, once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many quaint and curious volumes of forgotten lore. And he was, uh, people were freaked out. Dude, I married him. That's <laughs> awesome. Keeps me up I think that's an ideal note to end on. It's like, I think so. And I should hey, also say. Parents out there, just know you too could raise an 18 month old. <laughs> you can recite the raven. An 18 month old bow. Uh, yeah. Is there anything creepier? Yeah. I think we just got there. Highly recommending Poe for toddlers. Yeah. I also have to say, as a, as, I don't know, third witness now, that uh, for the first time we looked out before you guys came this week, looked out and saw the biggest raven I've ever seen out front of our kitchen window while we were having breakfast so, so we, you, we've got them all the time now now we live a little bit out of town we've got okay, a bunch of, my go. daughter wants to catch and train one she's pretty determined she, she, they're trainable oh yeah yeah she's, you can even teach determined. them to talk yes yeah. it's illegal but she's determined because you know what rebel <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that thank you all for listening this That's has been end. walter kern amanda fortini with brian cole and andy <laughs> wilson thanks for having us cheers Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. Before you go, I want to recommend Christine Cohen's The Winter King. Wintry and dangerous, but hauntingly lovely, The Winter King is the debut novel from Christine Cohen. Ever since Cora's father disappeared through the ice, whispers about her family's curse have grown increasingly louder. Desperate to help her mother and siblings survive another bleak season in The Winter King's frozen grasp, Cora begins to blend and even break the rules she has kept since she was a little girl. But when she discovers a secret that's much bigger than herself, she realizes too late that she has to put herself and those she loves in even greater peril. Get The Winter King today at canonpress.com or get the audio exclusively on the Canon app.